our program is as displayed. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, and our esteemed guests on call, our valued participants, I will now come to our webinar, February webinar on effective checks, on effective audit checks for SARS applications. And we are delighted to have you all join us this evening for what promises to be an enlightening and insightful discussion. Uh, throughout this webinar, we'll explore the intricacies of auditing SARS applications, discussing the key considerations, best practices, and effective strategies for ensuring robust security, compliance, and performance in the SARS environment. Uh, we encourage active participation, questions, and discussions as we delve into this important topic together. A uh, few housekeeping roles. We shall have a 10 minutes after at the end of the session. So feel free to post all your questions in the Q&A session. They shall all be attended to after at the end of the session. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here and we look forward to an, an engaging and enriching session. Um, my work is simple this evening, is to introduce to you our, our moderator this evening, who is, who is Ms. Sharon Chistinde. Uh, please, Brenda, kindly display this. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sharon is our moderator this evening. Sharon possesses 10 years of working experience in communication networks, auditing risk and governance. Sharon is a data communications engineer by profession. She attained through an academic degree from Mbara University of Science and Technology from Uganda. She has worked in the banking industry for four years in the electronic banking and business technology section. Sharon worked as a project region ICT personnel supervising tier four institutions for automation, digital integration into operations for financial inclusion. She's currently employed as, uh, as the information systems auditor at the Uganda Railways Corporation, where she provides assurance on systems, governance, risk, and compliance through, through audit. She has been a profound member of ISACA since 2016 and has attained Caesar Season Series and COVID certifications. She's a member of the ISACA Kampala Chapter Education and Events Committee. And she holds certifications from other bodies that include ISO 27001 Transition, ISO 27005 IS Risk Manager, and ISO 27002 ISMS Controls. CCNA, MS, CSA, and OCA. She's a family woman and a loving mother of a wonderful daughter. Thank you very much. So Sharon, you're most welcome. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Rita. Um, I welcome all of us to this webinar. It's going to be a very interesting one. So we have a wonderful presenter. Humbled by the introduction, once again, I'm Sharon Kisinde, and I look forward to attaining more. Uh, my role is not going to be a simple one. I really have to um, ensure we get the best of our very own Mr. John Chekovye. So members on call from all around, allow me to introduce Mr. John Chekovye, who is a professional career span a, a very a professional career holder on his journey. He it spans at uh, over ten years in internal auditing across various industries, including the banking, the telecom, the IT consultancy, um, at international level. Although he has also worked locally, he's done expertise. He has expertise in uh, IT auditing, risk management, finance audits. Wow showcasing his uh, versatility and adaptability to different organizational contexts. Uh, currently, he's an IT risk management uh, specialist in a multinational te telecom firm. And his role is majorly to oversee the IT risk management initiatives. Uh, Mr. John, whose photo we are seeing there, takes proactive steps to enhance his skills. And um, he already hold, he's already a CISA, he's a C-RISC, he's a CPA. He uh, already has a CC, the ISO 22301, and he also has a CISM. So herein, he's also pursuing a CIS um, certification. He's, act, he's, he's active involved 
involvement is in professional bodies that include our very own Isaka, a member of the Kampala chapter. He is a part of the PSCB and as well the ISC squared, which reflects his commitment to staying abreast of the of whatever is happening in the industry trends and the, he has, definitely has the best practices. Uh, Mr. Chikubye, CPA, he volunteers with the ISAC Kampala chapter, again, as a member of the Education and Events Committee. And uh, CPE lead highlighting his uh, dedication to professional development. He's a volunteer with the Cyber Peace Institution, where he offers advisory to affiliate institutions on a professional basis. Mr. Chikubye not only is not only a member of Isaac Kampala chapter, but as well a member of the Provisional Rotary Club of Maya, where he engages in the community service and philanthropic initiatives. Again, not leaving out that Mr. Chikuye has a wonderful wife and four lovely children. Just to add that, not only four lovely children. So, Mr. Chikuye. We are humbled uh, to have you here in Isaka Kampala chapter. I'll be the moderator for the session. And we please welcome you to take it away at this session. I believe members on call are waiting to hear from you all about effective audit checks for SAS applications. We welcome you, sir. Wow, thank you very much, uh, Sharon. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Rita for the for the introduction i can say the introduction does not have so much uh, that i have done but um it, it's brief enough uh, we can uh, we can move with that uh, thank you very much members who have managed to join in for this call and um today my uh, task will be not a simple one because uh, i've always been uh, on the listening side and uh, this time I am on uh, the delivering side. Uh, so um, today we are going to we are going to uh, to to uh, look through uh, this uh, wonderful topic of uh, effective audit checks for SaaS applications. And uh, before we dwell into it, uh, I'll just have to let you know that uh, when you look at um, uh, SAS applications and the audit checks, they are quite wide. So I'll not be able to look at everything, but I'll just uh, give some uh, brief insights on what you can start with uh, when, you, when uh, you, you're planning for this audit and are those key areas that you can uh, definitely look at. Uh, look at. Uh, then uh, uh, just also to inform us, uh, I know on call we have uh, a blend of both technical and non-technical people. So I'll make sure that uh, I limit the use of technical jargon as much as possible so that we can all be on the same page. I believe uh, there are quite a number of auditors uh, that are on the call. I would love to also tap into, this, uh, uh, into these insights. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, for overview uh, for, the, for today's discussion is going to be as uh, follows. We are going to have a recap of cloud computing, then uh, we shall delve into software as a service. Then uh, we shall briefly look at uh, the cloud shared responsibility model. And then uh, we shall look at the scope areas, uh, those areas which we can look at as uh, an assurance provider. And uh, finally, we shall have the conclusion. So um, the concept of uh, cloud computing is not new. I believe to many of us, uh, we've uh, worked in this, uh, uh, we've interacted with uh, cloud applications for quite some time. And uh, actually they have become a uh, part of our day to day. So uh, cloud computing, uh, one, of, uh, one of the writers and researchers on emerging technology uh, described it as a, a tap of water. You only use it when you need it, but available 24 seven. So when we are looking at cloud computing, what are we looking at? We are first of all looking at on-demand access via the internet. And two, we are looking at uh, computing resources. So the computing resources that we are looking at, uh, we're looking at uh, applications, we're looking at servers, 
uh, those servers can be physical, they can be virtual. We are looking at uh, data storage, we are looking at development tools, we're looking at networking capabilities and more. And uh, you realize that these uh, all these uh, resources, computing resources are hosted by uh, uh, people we call cloud service providers uh, at uh, a remote location. So uh, what happens is that uh, these uh, uh, cloud service providers make these resources available for a monthly subscription uh, fee, all uh, bills, uh, all your build according to your usage. So basically uh, that is uh, uh, briefly about cloud computing, uh, but uh, majorly we must know that it is on-demand access via the internet. So the concept of cloud computing has not uh, started uh, just recently. Uh, it's been evolving over time and uh, it started in, uh, in the 1950s uh, where we started with uh, the distributed computing, mainframe computing, uh, cluster computing, grid computing. I won't dwell so much in that uh, for the time be, uh, for uh, uh, because of the time constraints. But uh, I will start uh, from the bit of uh, virtualization. Uh, virtualization uh, definitely is not a new concept. It started uh, started some uh, many years back, uh, beginning with uh, IBM. It started with uh, that uh, virtualization concept. And basically it refers to the process of creating virtual layer over the hardware, which allows you to, uh, to, use, to run multiple instances uh, simultaneously on the hardware. So this, uh, this, uh, the, the, this concept of virtualization, it is the, it is the basis of uh, uh, cloud computing and uh, it is the basis of, uh, of uh, cloud computing services such, such as uh, Amazon EC2. Uh, VMware, uh, vCloud, and I believe many of us are aware of uh, of these uh, uh, services. Then from there, around uh, 2004, we have uh, the, the, the coming of uh, the Web 2.0, and that is where we are seeing uh, the interactive and dynamic web pages. And so uh, these mainly were, were common with the likes of uh, Google Maps, then uh, Facebook also comes in, then uh, Twitter, or what you call X, and uh, other social media platforms. So this Web 2.0 is basically uh, what makes uh, social media possible. And it gained popularity in, in, in uh, 2004. Then uh, we have uh, uh, things that, uh, we have uh, uh, service orientation that came in thereafter. And uh, basically with service uh, orientation, we are looking at a reference model for uh, uh, cloud computing that's uh, low cost flexibility and evolvable applications. So there are two concepts that were introduced in this uh, cloud computing model, and that is uh, quality of service, uh, which also includes uh, service level agreements and also software as a service. So this is where we begin seeing uh, software as a service coming uh, into the limelight. Then we had, uh, we had, um, we had uh, utility computing coming in there uh, whereby uh, services were uh, provisioned uh, for computing uh, resources uh, along with major services such as storage, infrastructure, etc. And these were uh, provisioned on a pay per use basis. Then uh, that is when we have the cloud computing now maturing. Uh, that is around 2006 when we have uh, Amazon Web Services. Uh, being created, and uh, it started with uh, the Elastic uh, Compute cl uh, Cloud, which is what we call the EC2 uh, service. And this service would definitely enable customers to rent virtual machines uh, as infrastructure for their data and applications. So uh, basically to look at uh, the different cloud computing uh, service models that we have, or what we call the prominent and uh, uh, and the main service models, because there are quite a number that have come up after this. So the main ones that have uh, that we have uh, uh, currently, we, we have what we call a software as a service, which is going to be our major area of concern today. And in this model, we are looking at software being uh, software applications being delivered over the internet, and these are often called uh, web services. So users can access these app applications and services from any location using. Uh, their computers, all mobile devices, as long as they have internet access. 
So with this model, uh, users gain access to the applications and uh, to the application software and the databases. Then uh, we have uh, what we call a platform as a service. With a uh, platform as a service, we're having uh, uh, cloud providers uh, hosting development tools uh, on their infrastructures. And in that way, uh, users can be able to access these tools over the internet using APIs, uh, web portals, or gateway software. Uh, with this uh, platform as a service, we are having, uh, actually many of these uh, platform as service providers host the software thereafter, uh, after it has been developed. And uh, we have uh, a number of them. Uh, for example, we have what we call Power Apps, and then uh, we have uh, what we call the Google uh, App Engine. Uh, all those ones are uh, pass uh, services. Then we have what we call the infrastructure as a service. Uh, basically there, we're having uh, uh, a supply of virtual server instances and storage as well as uh, APIs that let users migrate workloads to the virtual machines. Uh, users have an allocated storage capacity and can either start, uh, stop, access, configure. They can uh, also uh, increase or decrease uh, uh, usage as and when they desire. And uh, in that way, we have uh, what we call the Microsoft Azure, which I believe many of us are most conversant with. We have uh, Amazon Web Services, and then we also have the uh, Google Cloud. Now, we uh, when it comes to SaaS applications, these are uh, SaaS applications initially were, uh, as we shall see in front there, uh, they were not so much uh, in use. However, as uh, technology keeps evolving, uh, these uh, applications are being used from the basic to the more complex uh, complex uh, applications of, uh, for example, when you look at uh, ERP solutions, when you look at uh, security solutions. So many, uh, many service providers are coming up with uh, different SaaS applications and many businesses are adopting uh, SaaS applications uh, uh, for their different uh, uh, advantages as we shall be seeing uh, in front there. So uh, these common SaaS applications, we have uh, accounting software. Uh, in that we have uh, the likes of uh, Intuit or what we call QuickBooks. It's, uh, it's a SaaS, we have uh, Oracle NetSuite. Then uh, we're also starting to see some core banking applications uh, coming up on the SaaS environment. For example, there is what we call SDK Finance. That is uh, a SaaS, uh, it's a SaaS application that can be uh, hosted uh, on premises and also uh, online. Then uh, we also have what you call ERP solutions, all enterprise uh, resource planning solutions, uh, like D365, uh, uh, which is provided by Microsoft. We have SAP Business One, which is uh, provided by uh, SAP. We have Sage Intact, and uh, that is definitely also by uh, Sage. So we are seeing more complex uh, complex applications coming up uh, in uh, the SaaS environment. Uh, and definitely that also has to cause, uh, cause us as assurance providers to be uh, more alert. We have meeting applications like Zoom, Skype. We have uh, micro, Microsoft 365 apps, Outlook, Teams, Word, Excel, and so on. Then we have uh, more complex solutions uh, which come under the security solutions. Under that, we have the likes of Mimecast, we have uh, Sophos, we have uh, web application firewalls like the Cloudflare, we have Amazon Web, uh, Amazon web Services, WAF, uh, ETC. So you realize that from the simplest form of uh, just uh, uh, a, a meeting up to the complex one of uh, having a security solution, all of them are going uh, uh, somehow taking the direction of uh, of uh, uh, SaaS applications. So uh, that means that uh, we quite we have quite a number of uh, of things to look at as assurance providers going forward, uh, because uh, uh, SaaS applications are being adopted at a, a very fast rate. So we have some. Uh, uh, cloud computing statistics uh, that uh, I, I try to uh, put together. Uh, there is uh, one which is by uh, Google Cloud Brand Pulse Survey, uh, which is which was done in uh, quarter four, 2022. And uh, it projected that 40, 41% uh, of technology leaders say 
that they are increasing their use of cloud-based uh, services and products. So you see the direction at which we are taking. Then uh, we have uh, another one by Gartner, uh, that is uh, Top Strategic uh, Technology Trends of uh, 2022, uh, which uh, projects that by 2027, we are going to have more than 50% of enterprises are using industry cloud platforms to accelerate their business initiatives. Now, we are just in 2024, but we are seeing an explosion of uh, SaaS applications uh, that they are being used in most of our, of our environments. Uh, that we operate in. Then uh, we have also Flexera uh, 2022 State of the Cloud Report, uh, which uh, says that uh, more than 40% of technical and business professionals are using automated policies to shut down workloads uh, after working hours uh, and to right size underutilized instances. Uh, as we look at uh, the advantages of cloud computing later, we shall realize that there is this bit of uh, of, uh, of, uh, of deciding what uh, you have to keep running, uh, what you know, what is not in use, what can be discontinued, and what can be continued. Then uh, we also have more statistics uh, still in, in line with uh, with uh, cloud computing. Uh, definitely, the uh, largest market share of uh, the cloud computing services, according to uh, Statista is uh, Amazon Web Services, uh, which is uh, holding close to 31%. It must be more than this now, because these statistics are at end of Q4, 2023. Then we have uh, Microsoft Azure, which comes in with 24% uh, of the market share. Google Cloud comes in with 11%, and so on. Now, uh, what else are we seeing uh, from uh, these SaaS industry statistics? Uh, from uh, zipia.com, we realized uh, they came up with a report in uh, in uh, 2022, which show, uh, which uh, forecasts the trends for 2023, and they are saying that 99% of companies will be using one or more such solutions by the end of 2023. Actually, right now, uh, almost every business, almost every entity, somewhere somehow they are using a SaaS application, either knowingly or unknowingly. So 99% of, of uh, the companies are going to be adopting uh, more of these uh, solutions. Now, uh, we also have that, uh, uh, we have that 38% uh, of uh, companies run entirely on SaaS applications. So this report uh, uh, tells us that uh, currently uh, worldwide, we have 38% companies are running on SaaS applications, meaning that they do not have uh, in-house applications uh, running. So most of their workloads are uh, being uh, done on the SaaS, on, on, on cloud. Then uh, they also tell us that uh, the SaaS industry currently has an annual growth rate of 18%. So there is no way we are going to run away from uh, this, uh, from uh, from our SaaS applications. And uh, the only thing we have to do is uh, to embrace them. We have to uh, make sure that uh, we put in place uh, proper policies, proper procedures. We have to put in place proper checks uh, uh, so that uh, we can be able to encounter all the risks that come with them. Now, briefly, basically about uh, the uh, benefits of cloud computing. We have uh, what we call uh, self-service provisioning. Uh, definitely here you can spin up computing resources uh, almost for any type of workload on demand. And uh, things like server time, network storage uh, can all be managed uh, on cloud, uh, which definitely uh, reduces the, the, the reliance on IT administrators to provision and manage computing resources. Then we have uh, elasticity and scalability. Uh, this, uh, this definitely, uh, uh, with uh, companies can freely scale up uh, computing needs, uh, increasing and scaling down again as demand increases. So, in case you project that uh, uh, the, the the traffic to a given application uh, or uh, to any resources uh, is going to increase within a, a given period of time, 
you can provision for more resources, you can provision for more storage, you can provision for uh, for more uh, uh, bandwidth and so on, so that you can meet up the demand. And, and in case you realize that the demand will have to uh, reduce at certain uh, periods, then you can also scale down. Then we have paper use. Paper use, uh, definitely uh, these computing resources are measured at a granular level, uh, enabling uh, users to pay only for what resources or workloads they use. So basically, you do not have to keep incurring what we call uh, uh, what we call uh, OPEX uh, costs, just in in case you're not using the resources. You only pay for what you use. Then we have workload resistance uh, resilience. So uh, most of these uh, uh, cloud service providers implement what we call redundant resources to enable re resilient storage and to keep users' important workloads running. And this is mainly uh, often done uh, across multiple uh, global regions. So many of these cloud service providers uh, maintain what we call uh, uh, what we call availability zones. So you find that uh, these availability zones are, are distributed worldwide. So if we're having a problem, for example, in uh, in in uh, South Africa, where there is uh, one availability zone, say for Amazon. Uh, another uh, zone can be available uh, for uh, for continuity in say Middle East or North America and so on. So and then uh, we also have what you call multi-tenancy and resource pooling. You do not have to uh, invest in capex. Uh, you don't have to uh, to 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 uh, have what you call uh, capital expenditure on premise. So here we have we are looking at someone who has done their uh, uh, who has put up their resources and we're all just renting. Many users are renting uh, those resources. So we do not have to incur things like uh, a depreciation costs. We do not have th things like re uh, repair and maintenance. So that we are uh, enjoying uh, a pool of resources. Then broad uh, network access, users can uh, access cloud data and upload data to the cloud from anywhere with, uh, as long as you have an internet co uh, connection and you have an, inter uh, an internet enabled uh, device, you can always uh, access your resources. Now, with, uh, with uh, whatever we've seen uh, regarding uh, SaaS applications and then uh, the utilization, the increase uh, of SaaS, the increased use of SaaS applications in our environment, Definitely, it poses a security threat to us as entities and as assurance providers. And when you look at, we have trends of security breaches that have happened in the past. Some have been successful, others have been attempts. For example, just just some time back, I think that was 2022, uh, Google had uh, Google had uh, one of uh, one of the uh, the largest layer seven, or what you call the application layer uh, seven, uh, the application layer uh, DDoS attack, uh, where they recorded over uh, forty six million requests per second. So you realize that even for these established uh, uh, companies uh, which are hosting these uh, applications, they're always under attack and they're always being targeted. Now, we have uh, some uh, recent uh, SaaS application security breaches that have happened. Uh, there is one report that was uh, uh, produced by Valence Threat Labs in 2022, uh, which indicated that um, that uh, that uh, these uh, with uh, the increase increase use of uh, of SaaS applications and then integrations being adopted by uh, by these same organizations, uh, we're having very many of these applications that are coming into our environments without having security reviews being conducted. And this definitely has led to an increase in the frequency and magnitude of SaaS breaches and SaaS supply chain attacks. So we have uh, some of them that have been highlighted here. And uh, we have uh, one which was uh, on uh, January 26th, 2021 where a solar wind hack exposed my uh, mimecast customer emails uh, we know that uh, mimecast is an uh, email uh, is an email so, uh, email uh, defense solution that uh, is 
is uh, being deployed by many of uh, of uh, companies. So it is it is like a filter that is is uh, used to uh, to to filter emails, spam emails that are coming uh, into uh, our environments. So we had a hack on it. And then uh, there was one in uh, June 2021 where hackers used Slack to break into ear games. Then uh, we have one which was in August 24th, 2021, uh, where a misconfiguration in the power, uh, power platform exposed 30 million uh, customer records. So one thing we need to know about this, uh, this power apps uh, platform, it is used for uh, application development. So uh, users uh, can use uh, this application to uh, uh, develop their own applications uh, for use. Then uh, we also have uh, one which occurred in uh, on August 4th, 2022, where uh, 2FA uh, in Gmail was bypassed to read some customers' emails. And then uh, the last one uh, I will highlight is the one which happened in uh, 2022, where attackers uh, stole OAuth take, uh, tokens from legitimate GitHub uh, integrators to access GitHub customer tenants. So we realize that these uh, these apps are in our environments and uh, they are being targeted by hackers. And uh, this is being definitely uh, fueled by the fact that currently we have what we call cyber uh, cyber attack, uh, uh, cyber crime as a service. So we have people who have uh, definitely built uh, their resources. They have uh, well-established data, uh, uh, well-established uh, call centers. They have resources, they have everything they need to keep tracking, uh, to keep uh, trying to hack into uh, this SaaS application. So the more reason uh, me and you should get worried, but at the same time, we should just increase our vigilance as we, as, uh, we use and uh, utilize these SaaS applications. So briefly, let me uh, look at uh, what we call the cloud shared responsibility model. Now with this, uh, cloud re uh, uh, responsibility model, we are basically looking at security and compliance. So this model basically tells us that uh, uh, cloud sec uh, security and compliance is a shared responsibility between the cloud service provider and the customer. So if, uh, if you host your applications on cloud, you do not entirely have to uh, leave the responsibility of uh, of securing this application to the cloud service provider because mainly what they are doing is to give you a platform for hosting. So what is the rule of thumb under this uh, cloud, response, uh, cloud shared responsibility model? The rule of thumb is that the cloud, uh, cloud service provider is responsible for security of the cloud platform and the customer is responsible for security in the cloud. So. As long as you do not put in place adequate security measures, adequate uh, uh, logical controls over your application, you do not expect this to be done by the, cl uh, by the cloud service provider. So uh, this model is basically is, um, is quite large, uh, by large meaning that uh, uh, it encompasses what you call the SaaS, the PaaS and uh, the IAS. However, for this presentation, I'm uh, only uh, focusing on the SaaS. Now, we have quite a number of processes. We have uh, application configuration, we have identity and access management, we have application data storage, we have the application itself, the application operating system, uh, network flow controls, and then the physical security. Now, as long uh, when you are hosting these uh, applications on premise, all these processes will be entirely the responsibility of the customer. So you as the individual hosting, you'll be entirely responsible for all these processes. Now, when it comes to the cloud, uh, we have, just like I've said that there is a shared responsibility. So for the application configuration, it is going to be entirely the responsibility of the customer. You who is hosting the application on the cloud, this is going to be entirely your responsibility. Now, when it comes to identity and access management, this is going to be a, a shared responsibility. It's going to be 
part of it is going to be a uh, responsibility of the customer. Then the other part will be uh, the responsibility of the cloud service provider. How does this happen? Is that you as the customer, you are supposed to come up with what you call the, uh, the, the different uh, user groups. You have to map uh, those uh, user groups to the roles. Uh, so that uh, at any one moment, users only have rights that they are uh, that they need for their day-to-day -day operations, or what we call a, a role-based access. Then the other bit will be for the cl uh, cloud service provider. Remember, this cloud service provider, for example, uh, not, let me not even use say cloud service provider. The application provider. The application provider will have to come in to give you the license, the, the licenses for the different users. So Mr. the Shikide, rest, yes. Apologies if I've interrupted, but just okay. uh, for us to make, uh, to get some clarification, we've okay. got some questions. Are we going to answer them as we go along or we wait for the entire session to run? We I have think, one. Uh, from Ivy Nagai. Yes, please, sir. Yes, please, John. Uh, I'm thinking, I, I think, let's, let me first complete, then uh, I'll try to look at them uh, when I'm done. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Isn't that okay? What do members suggest? I would think I would better attend to them. Okay, if okay, maybe I'm seeing thumbs up. It's okay. Carry on. We shall have the okay. Q and A session at the end of the of the session after his presentation. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, okay. Let me proceed. Now, uh, we have what you call a common, uh, common SaaS security threats. Moment. Okay, uh, common SaaS security threats and uh, the biggest, uh, what, what I can call the, the, the biggest security threats of uh, these SaaS applications is uh, the misconfigurations. It is not the biggest, but Personal, I, I take it as one of the of the biggest. Uh, so what happens is that uh, with uh, when we have these multiple SaaS applications in our environments, uh, we have uh, okay, we have these uh, we have multiple SaaS applications in our environments, and then uh, there comes the problem of the configuration checks. So you realize that most of these applications, since they are being shared by quite a number of people. Uh, it is just a matter of ticking boxes here and there, depending on what applies to your environment. So sometimes we find that we, we find that uh, we miss ticking some uh, key, uh, some uh, some key boxes, uh, and that definitely also comes back to uh, what our company policies and procedures are. So whenever you miss, uh, for example, if uh, you, you're looking at uh, uh, configure uh, if you're looking at uh, user user access provisioning and uh, you realize that uh, for a particular user you are supposed to give them uh, rights that uh, let me le I'm just trying to lo look for uh, the simplest uh, kind of uh, right that for example you, you, you're giving someone uh, just uh, read only rights the moment you make a mistake and give them read write, uh, you just tick the read write, that can be a sec uh, that can pose a security a problem and uh, it, it it poses a risk to application. And most so you find that most of these applications have what you call frequent uh, updates. So whenever these updates come in, some configurations can change. So that means that we have to keep an eye on these applications to see that the configurations that we've uh, implemented uh, match with uh, what our security policies and procedures uh, require us to. Then we have SAS to, uh, SAS to SAS access. So we have quite a number of uh, SAS applications that are being uh, used in our environments. And uh, you find that uh, some of these apps are connected without the approval or knowledge of the security team. 
So you find that there are some uh, applications. Uh, for example, th there are things like uh, you've heard of what they call Grammarly. Then uh, th there are also some other applications that, that users can access uh, online. And uh, much as you have uh, security policies in place, all uh, uh, security uh, policies deployed on uh, the end users, these users can still continue using these applications without even the knowledge of uh, the, the security team. And definitely these, uh, these applications sometimes come with uh, what we call, uh, uh, what, what we call, uh, uh, so, sorry. So these employees connect these apps often to boost productivity, enable remote work and uh, build and scale companies work processes. So employees are prompted to grant permission for the app to read, uh, for the app to uh, to access, for example, read, uh, create, update, delete, corporate or personal data, not to mention that the app itself could be malicious. So by clicking that app, by just clicking that accept, because some of these applications prompt you, they ask, uh, do you accept to this application to access your, your information or data? all uh, photos or something and uh, users definitely most times just click ac uh, ac accept so by just clicking that accept you're granting uh, these applications and uh, these are uh, possible threat actors to gain access to valuable uh, company uh, data then uh, the third uh, security threat that we have is uh, the device to uh, the device to SaaS user risk so we have um, we have quite a number of uh, most of these applications uh, currently are uh, being available in mobile versions. Uh, we have the likes of uh, Outlook, we have the likes of QuickBooks, Self, Salesforce. All these can be. Uh, all these have what you call mobile versions. Now the problem comes in where we have uh, BYOD, uh, that is bring your own devices. So if I can access my uh, my uh, Outlook on. Uh, on, uh, on my mobile phone. My mobile phone does not have uh, company security policies that have been deployed to, uh, to limit the, 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 the upload or download of data. So just imagine someone has shared confidential company information uh, on my email and I access it through my device. I can download that, the, that information onto my device and you do not know what my device uh, can, contains. Most of these devices do not have, uh, they do not have uh, antivirus solutions implemented. Then at the same time, when you talk of uh, the, the BYOD and uh, the mobile, mobile uh, device management solutions, many of the users definitely are not willing to have these MDM solutions uh, incorporated, uh, 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 incorporated onto their own devices. So that means that you are leaving a gap for company data to get out there uh, into the public without any security, uh, without any, any, uh, without uh, having any stop to it. Then where we have uh, the likes of uh, mobile application management solutions, uh, definitely this can only work uh, where where uh, these devices have uh, a central control. Then the last is uh, the identity and access management. This is definitely uh, what um, I've talked about earlier. Uh, the fact that uh, process, we need to have uh, processes for users control in addition to validation of role-based access management as opposed to individual-based access. Identity and access governance helps ensure the security teams have full visibility and control of what is happening across all the domains. And also this uh, um, identity and access governance helps uh, enables the security teams to act upon arising uh, upon rising issues by providing constant monitoring of the company's such such security uh, posture as well as implementing access controls. So these are the major uh, common uh, such security threats that uh, I identified. And um, in case there are any other then you can always look at them. So what are those areas that we can uh, look at as, uh, as uh, assurance providers to evaluate? So uh, 
I will begin with, uh, uh, I will summarize them uh, in terms of uh, architectural design, uh, the information and data security, uh, infrastructure security, user access management, change management, incident management, management, patch management, and then backup and recovery. So uh, what do we usually look at under the architectural design? Now, this architect, architect, architectural design is usually part of uh, what we call uh, the RFP documents. Now, before, uh, before you, uh, you have an agreement with uh, this service provider, the, the result they call uh, a response to uh, the, the result they call a response to uh, a request for proposal documents. Now, in this in this response, this service provider should be able to show us the architectural design, and in there we we need to confirm that the website, the database, the application all reside in standalone servers, and to ensure that there is uh, there exists no single point of failure. Then what we also, what also those uh, uh, what we also have to look out in the architectural design is what we call the availability zones. So we also review that uh, the uh, the uh, uh, the redundant we also review that redundancy exists to ensure that business continuity uh, exists in for, uh, in case or in the event of a crisis. An availability zone is definitely just a separate zone within a region and. Uh, these availability zones have a distinct power source, network, calling, etc. So when we look at one availability zone has been compromised, what assurance do we have that our data is being replicated, our data and then also the application is being replicated instantly to another, availability, uh, another available availability zone? For example, if you are hosting uh, our application, for example, in uh, South Africa, where we have uh, an availability zone, we do not expect the backup to be done in the same availability zone. Let's have the backup instances uh, being maintained in another availability zone, for example, uh, in the Middle East or in North America, so that in case our South, uh, the South Africa availability zone is affected, then we can continue accessing our application, we can continue accessing our database uh, in another availability zone. And then the other, the, the also bit we have to look at is, uh, is uh, how our application is hosted. Is it being hosted in an active, active mode uh, in the two different availability zones uh, so that uh, failover automatically happens uh, whenever there is uh, a problem in one of the availability zones? So we have to look at uh, which kind of mode is being used. I wouldn't, uh, for some applications, I wouldn't expect to see an active passive mode being implemented, especially if it is uh, a financial, uh, if a finance related, uh, a finance related or uh, an application that, uh, that supports transactions, I would expect it to be in an active, active mode. And then we also have to look at, uh, when you look at the architectural design, we have to look at, uh, the legal and compliance requirements, whether they have not been breached. Now, some countries uh, in, in, right now, for example, when you look at the UAE, Russia, Vietnam, have what you call data localization laws that require financial, transactional, patients' data, ETC, all what you call personally identifiable information, not to leave the geographical boundaries of those countries. So in case we have our application being uh, our application and the databases being hosted in one availability zone, does, uh, does, does it uh, have any uh, repercussions in terms of uh, legal and regulatory requirements? That is one question that we have to ask ourselves. If there is a breach, if you look at uh, uh, what uh, the, your regulatory requirements require that you are not supposed to say, uh, have your data, PII data, uh, being resident in, other, in another country, then definitely that is something that you have to flag as an assurance provider. However, when I try to look at um, uh, the data privacy laws uh, of Uganda, and uh, I also looked at that of Kenya, uh, we do, uh, our, our privacy laws allow us to host, our, uh, to, to, to process and store uh, data outside the geographical 
uh, boundaries. As long as the service provider can tell, uh, can give us assurance that they have adequate uh, security measures in place to ensure that our data is protected. So uh, that is also something that we have uh, uh, legal and regulatory requirements are critical when we are looking at the architectural design. Then we have segregation of environments. We need to have that assurance that uh, there are two separate environments that exist, and that is uh, what you call the test and the production environment. I wouldn't expect an application and uh, the database to be hosted in the same environment. The test and uh, the production environments of a data of uh, an application to be hosted in the same environment. So that is something that we should always take care of. And also we should also uh, 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 take note of uh, the test environment that it should be a mirror of the production environment. And this can be achieved through uh, virtualization technologies such as Docker. So we must make sure that what the, uh, what the test environment uh, provides is the exact replica of what the production environment is. Then, uh, then uh, we also have to look at uh, the aspect of uh, uh, information and data security. Uh, so when we look at information and data security, we're basically looking at three principles. That is the confidentiality, we're looking at the integrity, we're looking at the availability of our information. Now, definitely there are quite a number of things that you can uh, look at so that uh, you can uh, evaluate uh, this uh, CIA. For example, uh, for example uh, let me just uh, have this uh, account here, uh, Intuit accounts. Let me just... Um, let me just log in so that uh, we can uh, see something practically here. Okay, so uh, there we are. We are on the URL for the Intuit. Intuit is uh, what we call the QuickBooks. I'll just run us through this briefly uh, to help us understand uh, what I'm trying to uh, to drive at. So this is the URL for this. Um... Mr. Chikubi. Yes. I, I think we haven't yet got the new screen. How about we first put down the PowerPoint? Okay. okay. Sorry. Okay, technology. Okay, I think uh, that can be seen now. Yes, we are good to go. Okay, so when when you have an application, uh, the URL, uh, just look at the following. Uh, I'm trying to just remove this so that anyway, let me leave it. So we have what we call uh, the common name. So the common name, this is definitely the, the URL for the application. So this URL should be able to show us that we are in the production environment or we are in the test environment. So I wouldn't expect us to uh, have an application that is running, uh, th that we are relying on, that is under test. We, are, we cannot use an application that is under test. We should use an application that is in the production environment. Then we have to look at what you call the common name. This common name here, for example, we see what you call uh, DigiCert. This DigiCert is, um, is a certificate authority. So we uh, definitely do not expect to see what you call self-signed uh, self uh, certificates in uh, these uh, these SAS applications, and uh, you know the risks that come with self-signed certificates. We definitely uh, they are definitely insecure, especially for public-facing uh, websites and applications. So we must ensure that this application this application is um, a digital certificate is issued by a reputable certificate authority, and uh, some of those are. Certificate authorities uh, include this DigiCert, which we can see here. We have what you call Amazon. 
we have uh, Microsoft uh, Global, Sci uh, Global Science, Sectigo, we have Entrust and so on. So these are reputable uh, certificate authorities that we can always look out for. So in case you find that this application is running on a self-signed uh, self certificate and it is a web, uh, it's a web facing application, then we must always flag that. Then we shall we should also look out for uh, the encryption standard that has been used. Now most of these uh, most of these uh, applications uh, are running on uh, the RSA, and this is uh, a, 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 uh, this uh, a cryptographic encryption standard has been in use since 1977. So it is one that has been trusted for quite some time, and uh, most of them that I've interacted with are using this uh, standard then uh, we also for uh, data integrity uh, we should also look at uh, the hashing algorithm that has been uh, deployed uh, most of them are using uh, the SHA uh, 256 which you can see here uh, SHA 256 so that is uh, one of them that uh, you must also uh, look out for and, and it is also being shown down here SHA 256 then uh, there are some other details that we can look out. For example, uh, the uh, uh, certificate valid uh, validity. Uh, you'll always get to see that this certificate is valid from this time to this time. So allow me to stop sharing this and I go back to uh, the to the Excel to the PowerPoint. Sorry. Okay, so what else can, uh, also, can we also look out for when we are doing uh, a review of uh, information and data security? We can also look at uh, the certifications. Uh, for example, has that uh, uh, application provider been uh, uh, certified uh, in terms of ISO 9001, that is quality management system, ISO 22301, that is business continuity management system, ISO 27001, security management system, and so on. So most of these uh, certifications are available when you try to, when you're looking out for a reputable, uh, a reputable uh, application provider, this information will always be available on their, uh, on their website. For example, when you look at a, a sub business one, they have this information available, the certifications that they have, and so on. Then uh, the other bit that we can look out is uh, look out for is the input uh, validation. Uh, we have to look at the data type. Uh, we have what we call the data type validation. Uh, this helps us ensure that uh, the data matches the, exec the expected data type. For example, where we have numbers, we only have numbers that uh, we can only have numbers being accepted as input. Where we have dates, only dates can. Uh, be accepted as uh, input to prevent errors caused by uh, incompatible data types. For example, you wouldn't, wouldn't want to see an, uh, a scenario whereby say an account number is uh, a mixture of, uh, of uh, special characters. It is a mixture of say uh, a month and so on. So those uh, tests can be done in the test environment. You can just uh, tell the application owner to log into uh, the test environment to, and and they try to put in input these uh, characters in these different uh, uh, these different strings to see that the application does not accept that particular data type where it is not supposed to be. Then the length and size validation uh, where where we have uh, for example uh, uh, a name a name should not exceed say twenty four characters then wouldn't, we can try to input a name uh, in that application and see if uh, more than 26 characters can be accepted or whether like two characters can be accepted. And that, uh, that can also help us uh, limit uh, and avoid what you call uh, buffer overflows and other related vulnerabilities. Then uh, format validation. Format validation, uh, for example, things to do with email addresses, uh, phone numbers, credit card numbers, all these have to be checked to ensure consistency and to prevent invalid data. 
For example, when you have an application that accepts what we call credit card numbers, credit card numbers ideally do not exceed 16 digits. So in case you have an application uh, which accepts credit card numbers, just uh, put random numbers there. However, you must also take note that uh, there are what we call uh, major industry identifiers. For example, if you have Visa, it must begin with four. That credit card uh, number must begin with four. Then MasterCard uh, must begin with five. American Express must begin with three and so on. So you have to ensure that, for example, if you are inputting a, a Visa credit card number, this uh, when you input uh, a MasterCard, this application automatically notifies you that this input is wrong. Then range validation, uh, you have to verify that numeric input falls within the acceptable range that prevent unexpected uh, security vulnerabilities. For example, a date cannot exceed 31 days. In case you have an instance where the date, uh, where the date string is, ex is accepting say 32, have to have that flag. Uh, the month cannot exceed 12. So in case you have 13 somewhere, that can also be uh, flagged. Then output validation. Uh, do we have uh, the content that uh, this application generates? Is it consistent? For example, is it within the expected format? Uh, if you have uh, an application for uh, uh, a report that uh, which has, uh, for example, date, a, a date column in it, do we expect to see only date there? Or we can have also an email address being output in that column. So that is something that we can do. We can look at just uh, you know have some reports that you can generate uh, to see that uh, this uh, output uh, output uh, data matches with what is expected. Then the length limitation uh, limit the length of output data to prevent excessive data exposure, and this can all uh, this can be. Um, this can be uh, achieved where you have uh, filters available. For example, if you are generating a report, uh, you do not. Uh, you, you should have that option of generating uh, only those particular, uh, only that particular kind of information that you uh, need. For example, if you are looking at the report of uh, say uh, uh, of uh, uh, of say um, uh, customers that are in areas. Uh, it must you 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 must be able to filter out and say that I need, for example, the customer name. I need the customer date uh, of loan application, the amount, the amount, the amount outstanding, and so on. So any other information, for example, uh, collateral, in just in case you do not need it, you should have that option to filter this information so that you can get uh, reports that uh, are not bulky. Then we also have what we call consistency checks. Uh, if you if you download if you uh, download that report today, as at the same date, should it be the, will it be the same report that you will get uh, some days after, so that you do not have to, so that you you ensure that there is consistency in the reports that are being generated by the applications. All these are, are checks that you can make uh, in consultation with the application vendor. Then we have uh, infrastructure security. Now. As an assurance provider, you may not be in position to evaluate uh, the application, uh, the uh, the application uh, service provider's adherence to the relevant security, availability, processing, integrity, and confidentiality controls. However, uh, what you can do, you can rely on reports uh, from third parties. For example, there is what we call the SOC 2 type 2 reports, or even uh, what we call independent auditors reports. Uh, so basically, when you look at these SOC 2 type 2 reports and these independent auditors reports, they are looking at a number of aspects. For example, the access controls, the backup and recovery, the change management, incident management, and so on. Now, one thing you must be care, uh, careful about is that, uh, for example, when you're looking at these SOC, uh, SOC type 2 reports, these SOC, type, uh, SOC reports are time bound. Usually, they run for a period of one year. And so when you are uh, carrying out an evaluation, first look at this report, is it valid? And in case it has expired, then look out for what we call a bridge report. Usually these bridge, bridge reports come in at, uh, to bridge the gap between the expiry of the SOC report and also 
uh, when the next SOC report will be available. So they will give you that assurance that uh, the controls are in place are uh, adequate. So just like, again, I said, uh, these uh, reports can be available on some of these uh, websites. For example, when you look at uh, this sub business one uh, sub business one website, you can get there, SOC report there, and that can uh, help you uh, look at a few things here and there. Then we have what you call uh, what we call user access management. Now, this is one of the uh, main areas where uh, we tend to uh, mess up when it comes to these uh, SaaS applications. Now, when you look at the joiner controls, we have to evaluate whether there, there, there is a process for en enrolling users onto the application. Do we have what we call uh, 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 um, request forms being raised? Are they approved? Who is approving them? Is the application owner aware that this person is being enrolled onto the application and so on? So can we have enrol enrollment tickets being tracked is, say, in, say, uh, a ticketing tool? That is something that we have to look out for. Look out for these ticketing tools. Uh, just get a sample of uh, some users that have been enrolled within a given period, then track, uh, trace them back to what we call uh, ticketing uh, uh, tickets, enrollment tickets, to see whether these users have been approved uh, by, by the application owner. Then uh, we can also look out for what we call duplicate accounts. Now, most of these SaaS applications are, are charged per license. And in case we have uh, duplicate accounts, all duplicate users uh, being maintained on these applications, it is a cost to us as a company. And definitely it, it, it has a financial impact because if you're being charged per license, then that means that even a license that is not being used by, uh, by a user is going to be charged. So as an assurance provider, look out for what we call duplicate accounts for these SaaS, uh, in these uh, SaaS applications. Then uh, when you, look at, when you look, look at the levers controls, do we have a process of communicating levers to the application support team for deactivation? Uh, are all levers deactivated? We have instances whereby uh, a staff leaves and then uh, their account remains active uh, for a number of uh, days before they are being deactivated. Remember, as long as the account is uh, as long as the account is active, we are going to continue being charged as a company. So, do we have a formal process of having these users deactivated? Do we have uh, a tracker of where we check for which users have been deactivated, uh, when did they leave vis-a-vis uh, -vis when, when they were deactivated and so on. Then for any user accounts that are still active, what is the reason? Note that every user who leaves must be deactivated immediately. Some of them are kept, uh, are, are kept uh, for some uh, purposes. For example, where you, ex where you suspect a fraud, you can leave that account uh, uh, active for some time, uh, you can deactivate it, but do not delete. You deactivate, but not delete. And in case it has to remain active, what is the reason for being, uh, for being active? Has there been uh, an authorization uh, obtained to remain, to keep this account active and so on? And then which activities are being performed using this account since the owner left? Those are things that need to be checked out for in the audit trail. Then, uh, in case you have an unwanted user, do we delete them or disable? We have instances whereby some of these SaaS applications have the option of deleting a user who has left or who is no longer needed. So we must always, uh, we must always guard our institutions about deleting users. Because uh, when you delete a user, most times even the audit trail is deleted. So let's leave these accounts disabled in case this application allows uh, an account to be uh, deleted please flag that then we have uh, what we call um, access reviews uh okay we have what we call a segregation of duties sorry do we have a segregation of duties matrix in place and uh, a role matrix are these two mapped because you may be having uh, a role that is not mapped uh, you, you may be having a, a role, for example, that is not uh, mapped to uh, a user group. Ideally, when we are assigning uh, when we are assigning rights, we should assign rights using the role the, the role groups that have been created. Let's not uh, uh, 
assign these roles, let's not, uh, I wouldn't want to see an instance whereby uh, these roles are assigned in, on an individual basis. Let it be a role-based access uh, when we are giving out these roles. So can the, uh, also the, uh, the application generate a list of all users and their respective roles, obtain all users list uh, from the application, confirm that no user has conflicting roles. So sometimes we, just like I told you, these applications are a matter of ticking a box here and there. So you may find that a normal use, someone who is supposed to be having normal uh, user rights is being, give, is, uh, being assigned a uh, supervisor rights simply because they ticked a, a, a wrong, uh, box. So let's have these uh, roles, uh, these uh, users, all the application users uh, generated and look at their roles. Let's map it to, uh, to the actual roles that these users are doing. Then privileged access management. Do we have any default uh, application uh, privilege accounts still active and in use? This is something that I definitely do not expect to see. Uh, all these default accounts should be uh, just used for uh, application setup. Once it's done, let's create local administrator accounts so that we can track activity of these privileged users. Then are uh, all these privileged uh, accounts attributed to uh, known individuals? Definitely, this is something that we need to look out for. We don't want to see any, uh, uh, any uh, account that is reading admin. That is not proper. Let's have these administrator accounts being attributed to a particular individual. For example, if someone is John and is an, is an administrator, we can have John as a normal user. Then we can have John.admin as an administrator account. Then um, how are we monitoring the activities of the privileged users? Are they monitored proactively or reactively? Now, some of these applications are standalone and they are not uh, integrated with the same solutions that are in place. I would always advise that since uh, uh, manual reviews are almost next to impossible, in case you have a SIM solution in place, always have this application, these applications integrated with the SIM solutions as long as the option is available so that we may be able to track the activities of the users. Then uh, access reviews, how often do we, con uh, do we conduct uh, access reviews? Uh, that is something that we need to take care of. Uh, this can be done quarterly, they can be done uh, by annually, they can be done annually, depending on the sensitivity of the information that is being processed by the application. Then um, dormant accounts, those are some things that we have to look out for uh, when we are looking at the application reviews, uh, the access user access management uh, reviews. If we have any dormant account, for example, if you are having a financial uh, a financial application, if a user has not logged in for more than 30 days and they have not been on leave, why should we leave these uh, users active? Deactivate them so that in case they need that, uh, in case they need to use the application, they can uh, request for fresh rights. So I always want, to, I always tell people that just in case you see that something uh, for just in case you see an act, an account that is in uh, that is dormant always have action taken on it because some of these accounts are the ones that are used by manipulative actors to cause what you call security breaches then our password configuration uh, sorry password configurations and uh, password security configurations do we have a password policy configured uh, on the application and is it consistent with the approved organization policy, uh, organization's policy? Matters to do with password length, password history, age, complexity requirements, account lockout and threshold, all need to be taken care of. Uh, then uh, definitely as technologies keep evolving, we have features like single sign-on, we have multi-factor authentication. And uh, if the application has, had, uh, has these capabilities uh, uh, incorporated, then let's make sure that we use them to enhance the security of our uh, applications. Then um, things to do with the integration with Active Directory to ensure consistency in user access and authentication. Uh, definitely, uh, whenever I integrate with, uh, with the Active Directory, there are quite a number of uh, 
of uh, of uh, of uh, issues that you, you that you you always have to that you limit. For example, the issue of having multiple passwords. And uh, whenever someone has multiple passwords, they are going to be tempted to write them somewhere. They are going to be tempted to save them in their on, on their PCs and so on. So just in case we have uh, any breach somewhere, most of these passwords shall be uh, accessible. So when we have uh, uh, these applications being integrated with AD, we can have uh, some of these uh, issues being resolved. Then are the passwords masked? This is also something that is important. I would not expect any such application whereby uh, an input of passwords is visible. So as someone is inputting the password, they are visible. That is something that I wouldn't expect. You can also look out uh, for that. So management of global administrator accounts, many of these uh, applications come with what you call global admin accounts. And there you should be limited to configuration purposes and known for day-to-day -day application management. As an assurance provider, in case you find any, in case you find that no local administrator accounts are created, then that should also be flagged. Uh, members, please uh, allow me to move a little bit faster uh, due, to, to, due to the time constraints. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Then uh, um, change management. Uh, do we have change, uh, change logs maintained by the application? Is the access restricted to the administration, uh, to the apps admins? Uh, how often are these change logs reviewed? Are there change requests raised and approved whenever changes are being made? Is there segregation of duties uh, when, uh, when uh, raising and approving changes? How many change requests, are, uh, how are, they, are these change requests maintained? Are they, are they securely maintained? And then are these changes tested in the test environment prior to deployment in the production? That is something that definitely uh, we have to look out for. Then uh, patch management, definitely uh, patch management will always be the responsibility of uh, the application uh, vendor. The application uh, vendor should always uh, be able to uh, patch uh, their applications. Now, patching does not only uh, uh, wait for the application only, but also the infrastructure in which it is running. Now we have what we call the National Vulnerabilities Database. And in case you realize that uh, you're running an application, uh, so say the underlying, uh, underlying infra is running on my SQL 8.01, uh, Aurora 3.03, and so on database, there are known vulnerabilities in that uh, NVD uh, database. So you can always uh, uh, look out for these uh, vulnerabilities from that database. It can always be a very good resource. And in case you find that there are any of uh, vulnerabilities that have been identified in, any under, in the underlying uh, operating systems, in the underlying infrastructure, please uh, have them flagged. Then uh, the backup and recovery, uh, we need to know the frequency of the backup. How often, are our, how often is our data uh, being backed up? And what is the retention period for the snapshots? This is very important. Uh, in case you find that uh, the retention period for the snap, uh, snapshots is uh, unlimited. Uh, that is uh, to your benefit. In, in case you find that is, it is, say, uh, just two days or three days, then you should also be able to uh, evaluate and see uh, how best you can uh, have that uh, worked on. Then audit trail and log management uh, is uh, the application, uh, is the audit trail enabled on the application? That is something that definitely we'll have to look out for. Uh, you have to uh, be able to generate uh, these audit trails uh, and those logs to see that all the information is uh, adequately captured. For example, the timestamps are there, the date, the user IDs, the action that has been done, all that has to be looked out for. Then uh, do we have any log reviews that are being done? That is also something that we need to look out for. The log retention periods, remember some of these applications keep writing these logs. So let us look out for the log, log retention period uh, of, uh, of uh, these applications. Then uh, uh, the information completeness, uh, is all the information complete and can it be relied on in case of an investigation? That is something that we can all, also look at. Uh, members, uh, there, in conclusion, uh, audit checks are indispensable for maintaining the integrity, security, and uh, compliance of these SaaS applications. 
and by investing in robust uh, audit processes, organization can uh, instill confidence in their users, protect sensitive data, and uphold the reputation of their brand in an increasingly digital landscape. Uh, thank you very much, members. Uh, let's look at uh, the questions. Okay. I hope I'll Thank have much, enough time John. to answer the questions. Yes, I can see the team is making good use of uh, the online session by sending you the hand claps. They've uh, appreciated, personally I've appreciated. I also had very many questions, but I've saved them because of the, the time. So, wow. 17 hearts already. So what do we have in the question, uh, in the question, the chat? Let's start with that. One, um, let me leave out the name. Someone asked what exactly falls under application configuration. Uh, thank you very much uh, about uh, for that question. Now with uh, application configuration, basically we're looking at are the settings. Okay, now uh, there are quite a number of, uh, depending on the application, there are quite a number of uh, settings uh, that need to be look, uh, looked out for. Uh, in, uh, in any given application, there are, uh, there are quite a number of uh, things that uh, can be config uh, that are configurable. And, uh, sorry, mm. there are quite a number of things that are configurable uh, things to do with uh, uh, the URLs. Uh, then, uh, when connecting to third parties, uh, there is uh, there is need to know uh, the URLs uh, that are, are being uh, used. Are they secure? Then uh, we need to look at also the API endpoints. Uh, are, are we having secure APIs that are, are, are being used uh, in this application? Then. Uh, in case we have what you call uh, also connection strings, uh, the database connect, uh, connection strings should also be placed, uh, should never be placed in your code. That is also uh, a configuration that you can look at. Then uh, you can also look at uh, what you call uh, uh, special messages. Uh, special messages, for example, uh, 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 for this special, uh, uh, sorry, uh, for the, let, let me just look at formulas because uh, of the time, uh, time, time is uh, yeah, is not on that's my a handful, Mister Chiku. You probably you might have to leave us with uh, any account you're comfortable with that we get mm. to you. Yeah. So okay. Oh, uh, I I believe the our host has been given a our attendee has been given a very good answer. It's a handful. So the next question in the I would want us to cover this uh, Q and A session in not more than uh, three minutes. The next uh, question. Could you share relevant and up-to-date policies and standards we can use to perform system audits on uh, such applications? These standards uh, cover all aspects of the audit with a, sec with a cyber security perspective. Did you get the question? Could you share relevant and up-to-date data, uh, up-to-date policies and standards we can use to perform system audit on SaaS applications? Uh, okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, so currently when you look at, um, when you look at uh, uh, the standards uh, that in place that can be used for auditing these SaaS applications, uh, for example, when you look at uh, the ISO 27001, uh, yeah. Yeah, 27001 uh, is uh, a good resource that you can uh, that you can look out that you can use because it has uh, a number of uh, of um, it has a number of uh, aspects that are, are being considered there. Uh, you have things to do with uh, with uh, change management, things to do with incident management, user access management. Uh, then uh, thing, quite a number of uh, information there that you can use. Uh, for uh, for SaaS application reviews, then uh, uh, another another resource that you can look out for. Um, I'm 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 trying to. Th then you can also look out. I think you can also use uh, the NIST. The, the NIST, NIST standard can also be used for. Release. 
yes, the latest release can be used for for these uh, for these reviews. Then uh, then you can also use uh, the OWASP. OWASP can also be used uh, when you are reviewing these uh, uh, SaaS applications. So those are some of the few standards that you can uh, use when you are looking at uh, when you are reviewing uh, these uh, applications. Okay. Um, someone asked, how do we get to the certificate viewer page? Uh, what steps you took to the demo? Okay. Uh, sorry. Let me let me stop sharing. Okay. In the uh, meanwhile, I, uh, we have to recognize someone uh, greeting us from South Florida. Thank you, John, and the chapter. Um, the secretary confirmed that the slides uh, shall be uploaded on the engage. Please take it on. Yes. Yeah, then uh, so uh, uh, can my screen be seen? Yes, it can be seen. Okay, so you, you come uh, just in the middle, uh, in the corner here where there is that uh, that lock sign, then you click on a uh, uh, connection is secure. Then there is this icon up here, which has, uh, I don't know if you can see where my mouse is. Can you see where the mouse is? Yes, I can see yes. where the mouse is. So when you click there, it will take you to this information. Okay. Um, so that will give you the validity, the certificate authority that issued it, then the certificate name and so on. Mm. Okay. Then uh, the last three questions, let me read them. Oh, okay, let me read them. What about uh, data-related threats? And the other, which is also related, what are what are key considerations when testing data centers? Uh, data centers in uh for the cloud service provider. L yes, I think that the our anonymous attendee did not uh, specify, but they asked mm. that what about uh, data related threats? And um, this question came up at a point when we were talking about the the SaaS threats. That we are looking yes. at so mm. now uh usually uh when it comes to these SaaS applications you realize that uh this goes back to the architectural design we must have that uh, assurance that our information all our data is uh, being hosted in a separate uh, tenant we should not be having any instances whereby uh we are sharing any tenant with another uh, uh, with another um, with another user, so we should have that assurance from uh, from uh, the, the uh, provider that we are hosting our application, the database in in a different tenant that cannot be uh, accessed by another user, and that also goes back to what we call the SOC reports and independent auditors reports. These can also help you to gain that assurance that. Uh, your data is safe. Your data is secure, and uh, you know, and your resources are not being shared by any other uh, user. Uh, something else that I've left out on that. Mm, no. Okay. No. So, lastly, for many SaaS applications, don't you think these will be translated into SLA-related commitments? And the SaaS customer may not even give you access to all this, especially unless you are a very large customer. Uh, we can answer that with what relevance, what, what's the relevance of SHA 256 fingerprints when carrying out an audit trail? Uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, about um about the uh, the contracts uh, this is something that had um, that I did not include just like I told you earlier when I was beginning that uh, this topic is quite uh, large and uh, and I could I cannot exhaust it within uh, the time but uh, definitely the S the SLA is uh, very important because it will have to give you uh, quite a number of uh, of uh, uh, quite a on things to do with uh, the service level agreements, things to do with uh, the security provisions, 
then the confidentiality clauses, the dispute resolution mechanisms, and so on. So this is definitely the, the first bit that you look at. Uh, I did not want to go into that bit of the procurement. I just wanted to go into the, uh, the application itself. Because I'm looking at that, uh, uh, why I just moved directly to here, uh, knowing, okay, th there are some uh, firm, there are some entities that have uh, a standalone procurement uh, uh, t a team that is uh, that that is uh, purely uh, th that purely uh, handles those matters, uh, pro procurement and then uh, legal. They usually handle those matters. So, what I'm basically looking at is the application itself. I'm not going into the uh, the procurement and then the legal bit of it, but that is also very key and it is very important. We must have the uh, contractual terms uh, clear and. Uh, oh. Okay. Yes. Mm. Okay. Yeah. So just to add on it, like we can also use uh, this uh, webinar to give us insights on what we are going to include in our SLA reviews. So, um, Mr. Chikubye, the questions are flowing in, but we have no option. We have run out of time. Uh, as a moderator, I thank you very much on behalf of our attendees. You really have done us a uh, it's been a great evening. We have learned a lot. We know we are going back to our organizations, uh, changed people, and ready to perform effective uh, SAS application audits. I believe that people might want to reach out to you. Uh, probably the board secretary will advise on how you may share your contacts. We thank you very much. And from me, Sharon, I thank you. I wish to hand over this uh, session to the secretary, Madame Reta. Are you with us? Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Okay. Thank you I very wish much. to officially hand over. We thank you very much. John, thank you. Okay. Wow. 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 Thank you very much, Sharon, for volunteering to, to moderate the session. We appreciate your services. For John, I can't thank you much. For sure, you, you should have handled this topic better than you, I believe. And everybody should be appreciating right now. And I believe your insights, perspectives, and ideas, we are truly enlightening and inspiring. And uh, they were undoubtedly enriched. The knowledge and understanding of all the participants, including myself, by the way, this is me to you. I believe uh, your willingness to share your experience, expertise, and engage in a meaningful discussion like this, has played a pivotal role in making this event memorable and impactful. Thank you very much, John. We deeply appreciate the time, effort, and commitment you have invested in making this webinar a success. Thank you very much. Um, before I go to announcements, I just want to recognize a few members on the call. We have our board members, Mr. Joseph Luvega, the membership director. Thank you for joining us. We have um, the events committee member, Brian, Mr. Brian Rutebenberua, Mr. Lloyd. Uh, Ms. Catherine Wire, thank you for joining us. We have Ms. Samarika Chibale, the Vice Chair for the Chile Tech Committee. We have Mr. Bernard Arinaitwe, who is the member of the Marketing and Communications. We have Ms. Barbara, Wine, Barbara Wawide, who is the member of the Chile Tech and as well as the Events Committee. Mr. Emmanuel Mugabe, thank you for joining us. Mr. Jimmy Ayek, we have our board member and an ancestor who has joined us. I last, I think, uh, the time I was joining Isaka, he was a board member that was in around 2011. 20, 20, Mr. Johnson Akanijuka, thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, we have our guest, Mr. Mehmet Shunet, the Isaka South Florida chapter president. Thank you for joining us. We also have uh, Daliso Tony Philly from Lusaka, Zambia, uh, Isaka, Zambia chapter. We have Mr. Augusta Sindamaje from Rwanda chapter. We have Mr. Samson from Tanzania chapter. We have Rita Chosa Carl from Singapore. Thank you for joining us. We are grateful. Please keep joining us once more. So please, our announcements. Brenda, please, can you put the announcements? Um, first, uh, we will have the Women's Day. First of all, 8th. This 8th, 8th March is an National Women's Day. 
However, for Isaka, we are going to celebrate the women's. It's going to be a women's month. We shall. We are, we are going to celebrate from the first of March up to the last. And um, all the chapters will be celebrating their Women's Day, International Women's Day, on different days. For Isaka Kampala chapter this time around, it's going to be different. We have partnered with our chapters from East Africa. So it's going to be a, a joint event, Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, and Rwanda. So we, it shall be on the 28th of March. Just keep watching. We are going to broadcast. And uh, our theme will be Breaking Barriers, Women's Impact on the Digital Frontier. Please, you'll have speakers. Just keep on the watch. Don't wait to be told to register. Remember, the slots are few. It's first come, first sub. Remember, it's East Africa. It's everybody. So if you come in late, you might miss out the chance to attend. The moment you see the first broadcast, be the first one to register. Looking forward to seeing you there. Thank you very much. It will be as usual, 7 o'clock, 282. It will be six o'clock. The time is it will be six o'clock to eight o'clock. So thank please uh, keep on the watch. We are going to broadcast this. Secondly, we also have our Caesar season exam preparation classes, which will take place on uh, will start on 6 April to 4th May and again 6 April, yeah, to 22nd. Sorry, 6 April to 4th May, and others will start on April and to 27th April. So we have both, both classes and the fees are 900 UGX for members and nine members 1 million. So please register. They are already there on our website. Free to log in and please um, register or invite a friend or a colleague who has not done these courses. courses. Thank you very much. Um, before I invite our president to give us the closing remarks, I would request John to give us the parting thoughts, please. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Rita, for for the for the uh, announcements and for uh, seeing us through this uh, session. Uh, just like I earlier said, uh, this uh, a review of uh, these SAS applications is uh, quite a wide one that uh, we need to give time and uh, with the required time, I could definitely not explain everything. I had just um, uh, you know, just give a few insights here and there. However, uh, I will be able to share the the I will share the the presentation, the full presentation uh, with Isaka, and uh, they can be able to to share with share it with the members. And uh, at the same time, uh, such applications are here to stay, and uh, we have quite a number of them in our environment. Sometimes we know and we're aware of them. Sometimes we are not. Uh, aware but uh, we just need to devise means of uh, how we can uh, effectively uh, review them uh, so that we can have secure environments so they come they pose quite a number of threats uh, in our environments especially to do with uh, uh, data breaches and uh, information security so we need to have adequate controls uh, we have to uh, look at these controls um, more regularly to see that uh, we are up to standard with uh, the requirements of our policies, our procedures. Our policy should be regularly uh, uh, updated. I know many of us here have uh, uh, policies that uh, our information security policies and uh, procedures do not include these SAS applications, but it is something that we need to look out for. We need to incorporate these uh, uh, SAS application policies and procedures so that we can guide their use, their deployment, their uh, procurement and uh, all the other um, processes that come with them. Thank you very much for being a very good um, uh, audience and I uh, wish you all the best. We can always keep sharing information uh, regarding the same. Have a great evening. Okay, okay. Thank you very much, John. I believe the conversation will continue flowing off, 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 or even when we are off. Thank you very much. We shall. We shall engage you more and more. You have always been our CPDB coordinator, but I don't think that people didn't know that you are this rich when it gets to such issues. Please, thank you very much once again. Uh, 
um, before I invite the president, I really want to take this opportunity to appreciate the secretary staff, who are always the engine behind this arrangement. Brenda Akampria, our administrator, um, Bingley, Ms. Florence Nakalanzi, the executive secretary slash business development manager. Thank you very much for the very good work done. We really appreciate your work. At this point, allow me to introduce or call Mr. President, to come and give us the closing remarks. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Bernard, please, you're most welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rita. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you so much for joining our session today. On behalf of the board, uh, the chapter secretariat, the various volunteers, it's always an honor to have a big turn up uh, like we have this evening. and. In the spirit of continuous professional development, sharing knowledge, and allowing us to sharpen our skills and be better professionals, this is really the essence of ISACA. And I thank everybody for making it happen. John is a special member in our chapter. He leads and volunteers in the CPD role. And he does that while living outside the country. And so it's a challenge to the rest of us in terms of how much we can do to contribute to our profession. It's great to see old members and new members alike and people who have made it a uh, point to always attend. I think we can always grow and get better. Uh, in breaking with protocol, I've shared some few resources in the chat. Kindly uh, take a look at them. Uh, they will help us to go further. I believe John we will also share some other information through the, through the presentation that we shall all receive. So for me, it's just to say thank you and to encourage you to look out for the next events that we have. We have CPD events, but we also have an upcoming AGM, which will be announced formally, and we shall have uh, elections for a new set of chapter leaders this time around. And so please look out for the announcement. We shall look forward to your full engagement and participation as we build the chapter going forward. Thank you so much and have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you, President. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thank you and a good evening to you all. We had a turn up of up to 89 attendees on call. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Rita. Thank you, Sharon. And uh, thank you, Brenda.